Martin Luther King Jr. Day, the federal holiday observed on the third Monday of January, as we know as tomorrow. MLK Day honors the legacy of civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr. This holiday is a time of reflection of history, a time of tribute to those who've overcome suffering and injustice and praise for a powerful sustaining God. The church is forever entwined in the history of a people who've stood with courage against segregation and pushed forward with faith. Today at Parkview, we celebrate an empowering history that defines African-Americans, not only as people of color, but as people of faith. Today, we'll hear the story of six-year-old girl named Ruby Bridges, who went to school and taught our nation about integration. She was just here a minute ago. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. November 14th, 1960 was Ruby Bridges' first day at school at William France Elementary in New Orleans. Ruby's parents were sharecroppers from Tylertown, Mississippi, who'd moved to Louisiana in the late 1950s in search of a better life. It had been five years since the US Supreme Court mandated the desegregation of schools. Now Washington was putting pressure on Louisiana and other states that hadn't yet complied with desegregation. In a veiled attempt to appear compliant, New Orleans city officials gave 150 black kindergartners an entrance exam, which they had no chance of passing. But six of the 150 passed the test and Ruby was one of them. Ruby talked about that day and said, everybody was coming over and congratulating my parents. She's so smart. She passed the test. We're so proud of her. So I thought I was so smart that I passed this test that would allow me to go from first grade right to college. <laughs> we can take the picture, thanks. Three girls, including Ruby, were selected to attend William France Elementary, but on the first day, the other two had dropped out, making Ruby the only black student at the school. Ruby remembers, my parents only said, Ruby, you're going to a new school today and you better behave. There was a knock at the door. My parents opened the door and four very tall white men were standing at the door. Those four men were U.S. Marshals sent under order of President Eisenhower to walk Ruby safely to school. Ruby said, when we turned the corner, I saw all these people. There was a mob outside. They were barricaded just like at Mardi Gras. There were lots of police officers everywhere, just like at Mardi Gras. People were screaming and shouting and waving their hands, just like they do at Mardi Gras. I thought we'd stumbled onto a Mardi Gras parade. So I wasn't really afraid. Ruby spent that whole first day with her mother in the principal's office. There they watched white parents scramble in and out of the classrooms, taking their children out of school. 500 kids walked out of that school that day. Ruby said she didn't know what was going on because nobody explained anything to her. Finally, the bell rang. Someone came in the office and said, school is dismissed, you can leave. Ruby remembers sitting there thinking, wow, college is easy. <laughs> the angry crowds doubled in size by the second day. They shouted as she walked past with the federal marshals. Two, four, six, eight, we don't want to integrate. We're gonna poison her, we're gonna hang her. Someone in the crowd held up a coffin with a doll inside that represented Ruby. That second day of school, Ruby went to the classroom filled with empty desks. There were no other kids. There was one person in the room, a teacher from Boston, Barbara Henry. She was the only teacher at that school willing to teach a black student. Ruby looked at Barbara Henry and thought, she's white. She'd never seen a white teacher before. She looked like the people outside in the mob, but she wasn't. Ruby said later, she showed me her heart. 
The following week, other students started to return to the school and Ruby was confined to her classroom. She wasn't allowed to play outside with them or go eat lunch in the cafeteria. She said she looked out the windows in her classroom for other children, but she could never see any. She said the worst part for her about first grade was being alone. You're in a huge school building and every day you're the only student, she said. The other students were kept hidden from her. By the end of the school year, the protests had disbanded. Ruby was allowed to join the other kids and she was so excited to see them. This little boy looked at her and said, I can't play with you. My mom said not to play with you because you're a, and he used the N word, Ruby thought. So that's what this is all about. It's not Mardi Gras. This isn't college. It's about me, the way I look, the color of my skin. He hurt her feelings, she said. She wasn't mad at him. He was explaining to her why he couldn't play with her. He was doing what his parents taught him to do. And his parents were doing what their parents had taught them to do. To fear and hate people whose skin was a different color than theirs. We're still burdened with that narrative of racial division and injustice to this day. I mentioned Brian Stevenson in my Friday email this week. Stevenson is a founder of the Equal Justice Initiative and the author of the book, Just Mercy. He says the great evil of American slavery wasn't forced labor. It was the idea that black people aren't as good as white people, that black people aren't fully human, that they can't do this and they can't do that. And that narrative created the ideology of white supremacy for him. This is the true evil of American slavery. That idea that black people aren't as capable as white people was a narrative operating in New Orleans when city officials gave 150 black kindergartners that entrance exam that they had no chance of passing, but six of them did. That white supremacy narrative was wrong. But the angry mob outside William France Elementary believed in white supremacy. And they claimed that God believed it too. They aimed their venomous, self-righteous wrath at first grader Ruby Bridges. If you watch the archival footage of the mob of white parents cursing at this six-year-old child and urging their kids to do the same, it gets to you. And you wonder, how do we motivate people to love each other and say never again to racial bias and bigotry of this kind and all kinds? How do we rewrite the narrative of racial difference and white supremacy that we're still burdened with today? We all know it. It may not be the 1960s anymore, but it still looks like it. Lately, to many of you sitting here or listening today, know that firsthand. It feels like we've been leaping backwards into these hateful ideologies. I think there's a clue about what to do in this passage from Mark's gospel about Jesus blessing children. The people brought children to Jesus, hoping he might touch them. The disciples shooed them off, but Jesus was a rage and let them know it. Don't push these children away. Don't ever get between them and me. These children are at the very center of life in the kingdom. Mark this. Unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you'll never get in. Then, gathering the children up in his arms, he laid his hands of blessing upon them. When the parents brought their children to Jesus for a blessing, the disciples shooed them off. They harshed on them. Look, you can't be interrupting the Lord. Don't you know how busy he is? His schedule is jam-packed with teaching and healing. 
you've got some nerve shoving, shoving your kid in his face. They were outraged. Those pushy parents were dumping their runny-nosed kids into Jesus' arms. But the parents had seen Jesus' tenderness toward children. In Matthew 18, Jesus hoisted a youngster onto his lap and used the little one to explain spiritual truth to the crowd. People saw the gentle way Jesus treated children when he hugged them. He welcomed all children and blessed them. The racist crowd cursed six-year-old Ruby, and they threatened to kill her. How did we get here from there? How do we get to a better place in our country? A place of unity and respect for all nationalities and races. A place where everyone's rights are protected and upheld. Ruby Bridges knew firsthand the need to address the past in order to change the future. Her historic walk took place six years after the 1954 United States Supreme Court Brown versus the Board of Education ruling, declaring that state laws establishing separate public schools for black and white students were unconstitutional. Artist Norman Rockwell, a longtime supporter of the goals of equality and tolerance was inspired by the story of Ruby Bridges and school integration. In 1963, Rockwell confronted the issue of prejudice head on with one of his most powerful paintings, The Problem We All Live With. Ruby said, I was about 18 or 19 years old the first time I actually saw the painting. She now serves on the board of Norman Rockwell Museum. It confirmed what I've been thinking all along, that this was very important and it should be talked about. Ruby said Rockwell's painting put her on a quest to tell her story and work with children. So she returned to William France Elementary in 1993 when she enrolled her four nieces there. And she witnessed the same racism she'd seen as a little girl. To build bridges between the races, she volunteered as a parent liaison and established an after-school multicultural art club. She established the Ruby Bridges Foundation and started to share her story with students all over America. In 1996, Ruby was reunited with her teacher, Barbara Henry who, after that one year of teaching in Louisiana, moved back up north and became an activist for civil rights. Ruby and her former teacher traveled together and shared their story. Ruby said, I'm humbled by the way my story moves kids, about how Mrs. Henry didn't judge me, how all I wanted was a friend. Kids get that. They understand that. Our kids know nothing about racism. It's us as adults. We take racism and we pass it on down through the generations. That's why it's still around. All of us come into the world with a clean heart. If we're going to get past our racial differences, it's gonna come from our kids. It's been over 60 years since Ruby walked up those steps into William France Elementary and took her place in history. She grew up, she became a travel agent, married and had a family, and she taught her children to rely on God. Out of all the commandments, she said, if you could only keep one, the one you should keep is love your neighbor. That's the key. I have to care about you as a person and a human being. I really believe the longer I live, that it really has everything to do with love. Shall we pray? Loving God of the blessed, God of the oppressed, God of the intelligent and the ignorant, God of the pushed around yet resilient, God of those who embody your spirit holy and unapologetically in whatever color skin they're in. 
Help us celebrate others as part of the whole that makes up this wondrous world you have made. Help us be true to you, our God who loves us, and true to whatever culture that shapes our unique experience. Help us to love you with all that's in us and help us to love our neighbor. Amen.